when you look at someone like Quibi or Facebook or Snapchat, you know, they're kind of the new kid or HBO Max even, you know, they're the new kids on the block. So they're still giving the deals like Amazon and Netflix were just 12 months ago. Um, you know, even 12 months is a lifetime for some of these streamers in their life cycle and they're just maturing at such a faster clip than, than cable or broadcast ever did. Um, so that's posed a challenge in, you know, if you were doing a deal just a couple of years ago with Netflix or Amazon and then trying to get a similar deal now, uh, you're getting a lot of pushback. And, and the way that, that at least I'm seeing um, in my practice in overcoming a lot of this is really the content is king. Where if you have something that everybody wants, everyone will make an exception. And that, that's held true always. Um, but even more, you're getting a lot of pushback. And, and that same is holding true on the cables and broadcast networks as well. You know, they're, um, as, they, as the streamers are more established, as the cable networks have always been, trying to take more rights and pay you less for it. You have players like Quibi and Snapchat that are saying, we don't need all the rights. <clears throat> we just need rights for right now. And then in a couple years, you can get them back. You know, the Quibi model has that, that Phil touched on. Um, some of these newer players are adopting something similar. Um, and again, even Netflix and Amazon, just a number you know, of years ago, acted in similar fashion, but now, they're restricting more, and the cable operators are still competing with everybody. So it's still kind of in flux and non-scripted in what these deals really look like, even though non-scripted has been around a long time now, because of this influx of new players and new operators on the types of deals that they're willing to make. Um, and, and really, as it has always been, it's who has the most leverage, what deal, what actor, what talent, what concept does everybody want um, is still holding true. And uh, you know, as Phil mentioned, with the budgets going up, everybody's really having to increase with it. And everybody's really having to play ball. Um, you know, we're also, you know, touching on the morals clauses that you had. You know, that's something where you know you see a lot of uh, you know reality TV stars uh, or re people uh, on reality TV, um, a lot of my clients on their shows, their, their cast is always in trouble. They're, they're always getting arrested. They're always in the news for things that you don't want them to be. And everyone's always, you know, you know, we'll ask ourselves, you know, at what point is it become too toxic? Where are these morals clauses? How come we're, everyone's allowed to do this? Um, and, and that's starting to change, where even in these reality deals, Con, you know, things are becoming too much for for uh, production companies, for networks to want to tolerate and deal with. And the morals clauses are now finding themselves, um, if they haven't before been enforced, uh, they've always been in the talent deals, but now they're actually being uh, strictly enforced by a lot of the uh, a lot of these uh, channels and streamers and, and cable providers with the talent. And a lot of the behavior is not tolerated uh, anymore like it used to be. Um, again, for fear of liability and risk on behalf of the network, on behalf of you know, the production company making it, uh, you know, for any of these types of claims. Um, and similar with the EPL insurance you know, that you touched on, um, and they are high and expensive, and I'm dealing with something right now for a client, and they do have EPL insurance, and we're glad that they do, but the deductible is amazingly high on it, so now it's you know, kind of this numbers game on what, you know, what they're willing to do. But it's still important to have. And you do have to weigh that, you know, as you're advising and representing companies, um, uh, you know, or projects that uh, you think it might be necessary and weigh the cost benefits of that. Um, and, you know, for the most part, when it comes to the non-scripted of, you know, versus scripted, especially as potentially the writer strike might be, you know, might be happening, that's just going to create a larger influx of need for non-scripted. And where there's already such a large need for non-scripted, being a cheaper alternative in a lot of cases to scripted, um, certain networks and cable channels are getting rid of scripted content entirely and exclusively going to scripted or non-scripted. 
I think we're going to see some more of that, um, especially as more conglomerates have lots of channels in their portfolio. Um, more going to be dedicated to non-scripted. More of the streamers are using non-scripted. And, and one of the things that the streamers are doing, which cable did just a couple years ago, and I think you're going to see a lot more of this on the streaming side, is traditional scripted actors um, and actresses and, and personalities finding their way in non-scripted content, whether as docu-follow series, whether as hosting, um, but trying to draw you in to trying to draw the audience into wanting to watch the, uh, you know, who they know from a movie and from TV on a non-scripted show. And, you know, the, the thought here is you'll spend all your money on talent fees, but the show is going to cost you nothing to make. And, and we're seeing that a lot, uh, you know, with Quibi um, specifically right now. That's kind of where, you know, where I see, you know, what's been happening in non-scripted uh, on a lot of these topics. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and now, uh, Elsa Ramo. Yeah. Can I have my clicker? Oh, yeah. Thanks. Um, Show off. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I made a PowerPoint just so I don't get lost in it all. So um, it's great because Phil and Mitch on a very high level are giving you the updates in terms of how is the content being made, who's buying it, and, and what does the construct of that look like. And uh, what it ends up trickling down to is in the trenches, which my firm focuses a lot on, uh, we do production legal um, for all sorts of content. But just to give you an idea of how much the world just impacts even my businesses, I was 100% independent film five years ago. We were just doing independent film. And in the past year, we are now 50%, we don't even call it TV, serialized content. Um, we're primarily doing it for the streamers, unscripted and scripted, and 50% film, of which only 20% of those are made independently. Because for the most part, as you all know, like Netflix is green lighting and paying for an independent film that we used to make sort of off the grid or with structured finance a few years ago. So the impact of that is that you just when I started to get used to my boilerplates and my templates and I felt like I could train people and I, I, I had my grasp around it, in particular the past year, it's all changed, right? And so one of the things that we've had to do is we, you have to reverse engineer it because at the top level, the way in which the deal is being done and also combined with the way in which we're actually consuming content has changed so much and so seismically that provisions that we took for granted, um, thanks to Harvey Weinstein, a moral provision is not something we just glance at anymore, we dissect. And um, we no longer think about credits in a very sort of like blockbuster video way. And, and so these are, in particular, what I have found to be the five things I have to argue with talent attorneys the most about, but I didn't want to say that and come across... <laughs> Adversarial. Um, so, but but the the method is these are themes and issues I am dealing with on a daily basis. We are revising and updating our forms on a daily basis, and conversely, streamers that are generating their forms and their preferential provisions are also literally on a week by week basis changing their policy. So we're all kind of in it together, um, and the talent attorneys are on to us. So we got to kind of deal with these issues. So uh, just. Okay, so the first big thing is SVOD bonuses. So very traditionally with talent, and, and I'm, I'm kind of focusing on scripted feature film. Um, there's a lot of crossover that you'll see with the issues that Mitch raised and Phil even on sort of a higher level content raise, but these are kind of, I just want it to be within the construct of a feature film. Um, and the thing about SVOD bonuses is there's really two touch points where you really have to think about it and is relevant. One is, if you're um, advising a client before it gets financed or picked up by the streamer, right, you're entering into these talent deals, you know, it could be early stage, a director attachment, it could be your writer for hire agreement to just write the spec script, but you have to contemplate what's going to happen with that. And then after the fact, once the, the SVOD platform or the financier is involved, they also have their own policies and thoughts about this. Um, and so in particular, there's so where we used to provide, like, here's your fixed compensation, here's your net participation, which nobody ever sees, with some definition that we go back and forth on and, and had, that, had that at it, there were other types of measurable bonuses that you could do, things like box office bonuses, award bonuses, and those things still exist, right? Um, but things have changed. As you guys know, on Westwood... Um, 
in Westwood, you have the IPIC that's owned by Netflix and it's sort of like a fake theatrical, right? Just so Netflix has a big fancy billboard. But, you know, the idea of a theatrical release standing on its own has become sort of consolidated. And the fear from the talent is we can't live and die by a box office success because Netflix, for example, doesn't even make their data proprietary. They tell you what they want to about the data, but it's not like you can pull up variety and, and read a measurement scale and know what check to write. And so what has happened is, is that there, there has to be a ways for talent to address the fact that hey, there can't be net if you're getting a premium. Um, and there, there can't be box office if it's sort of a fake box office or a very limited release, but yet you have, you know, Irishman doing whatever it's doing on, on Netflix, but we have no idea. So, um, <laughs> there's a, there's a couple different bonuses that I, you go back and forth on quite a bit with talent now. So one is how do you convert in lieu of box office? So there, right. And the other thing is. Another thematic thing is, as you guys know, you can't really use the commodity of precedent the way that you used to, both on the talent side or the producer side. You can't say, oh, yeah, what did he get the last movie? That's illegal. And on the other side, the talent can choose what they want to tell you or not about precedent because technically they have to get authorization. So that sort of argument goes out the window. But when you're constructing a, someone who may have had a box office bonus at you know, $100,000 at $5 million DBO, and, and the talent attorney says, well, wait a minute, you guys are going to sell this to Netflix. You're going to be on Westwood Boulevard. It's not a theatrical. We need to convert it to some sort of buyout. And, and how do you value that, right? Um, and I will say that uh, talent agencies have some sort of proprietary Excel spree spreadsheet model where they come up with a number. And as a producer representative, I don't believe in it. But mm -hmm. you kind of have to figure out what the model is. So maybe if the aggregate box office bonus would have gotten you to a million dollars, you construct or figure out that at a certain budget level or, or at, a, at a certain sort of like streamer level, you can buy that out, almost like the premium situation, at 30% of the box office, right? And it depends on the talent and the leverage, but you have to be able to convert that numerical factor. The other thing that's tricky about that, though, is just because you're on Netflix or just because you're on Disney Plus doesn't necessarily mean they're not going to release it theatrically. I mean, Irishman is for all intents and purposes a theatrical release. And so a big back and forth that we have with talent attorneys quite a bit is like what constitutes a theatrical release where you're entitled to the SVOD bonus in lieu of box office, right? Because on one hand, the talent attorney doesn't want to, on a New York and LA two theater release, forego the SVOD bonus and, and look to a box office that they'll never earn. And on the other hand, we don't want to be in a situation where, you know, the streamer is disincentivized from like a platform release where they now have to pay the premium because, you know, so it's, it's a back and forth and it's definitely a struggle to figure that out.